Hello, I'm Bree Allison with Power of the Patient Project. Today we are joined by the Chief Medical Officer of Pinnacle Treatment Centers, Dr. Chris Johnston. He's better known by his patients and his colleagues as Dr. J. Dr. J is an expert in addiction medicine. He earned his MD at the New Jersey Medical School and practiced family medicine for 25 years before joining Pinnacle Treatment Centers in 2011. Dr. J, welcome and thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this is a pleasure. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you became involved with Pinnacle? Sure. So I have lived and been educated in New Jersey all of my adult life. And uh, I was recruited by my front desk person who was also a counselor at a clinical treatment program. And uh, she told me about this opiate treatment program that had opened up five miles from my house in an upper middle class uh, community. So it was kind of a surprise that they would put a program into uh, that kind of neighborhood, but, but that's more or less what Pinnacle does. We, we try and set up very nice, uh, inviting kind of uh, treatment programs so that, you know, people are comfortable going there. And uh, so I, I went in there and spoke with the people, uh, started working part-time with them, and then they opened a residential program, or they acquired a residential program, and one extension of that residential program was actually less than a mile from my house. So, so here I've been commuting a lot to South Jersey, and now all of a sudden I have this uh, very local job to do. Uh, and as things progress with Pinnacle, they gave me more and more responsibilities. I still work at that opiate treatment program close to my house, you know, and that's still my favorite thing to do. Uh, but I also get to travel now and meet teams all over the place. So it's been an interesting journey. That's great. And how did you get into addiction medicine? Like what led you there? Yeah. So in my family practice residency, so I always wanted to be a family doc, you know, the guy that does house calls, goes to the hospital, goes to nursing homes, provides a full continuum of medical care. But I've also been interested in behavioral health as well. And in my residency, my favorite preceptor also worked in a detox facility. So I uh, spent two weeks with him in that facility. And I was like really amazed by how these people were sitting in groups together and really working hard on their problems and learning new skills. And, uh, you know, the power of the group just really really struck me. And it was just a very interesting two weeks that I spent there. And then down the line, uh, a divorce led me to become a patient in uh, substance use disorders. And I think uh, healthcare providers become better providers once they've experienced the patient side of things. And, um, you know, I worked real hard on my personal recovery. And uh, one doctor at, at a meeting that I was at, uh, he told me, you know, you've done the, uh, the practical work, you know what it's like to uh, have a disorder and also how to get better, uh, but you really need to do the book work. So I did the book work. I went to uh, lots of courses. I uh, took the board exam for um, addiction medicine and, um, and subsequently started uh, bringing Suboxone patients into my uh, primary care practice. And, uh, and that was very, very rewarding because I was having all these younger patients uh, seeing their lives turn around 180 degrees in a matter of weeks and months uh, with adequate uh, treatment for the opiate use disorder. And this was in the early 2000s, so uh, it's like 2004 or so is when I started doing that. So I was doing it in primary care for a while before uh, Pinnacle started knocking on my door. So. You've had quite the journey. Yeah, yeah. It's been really, really exciting. And it's been so many changes that have happened uh, since uh, I started medical school and, and to where we are right now. Well, that's a good thing. Um, so can you describe what addiction is and how people become addicted? Yeah, so addiction is a very complicated thing. You know, a lot of people focus on the drug and it's not the drug. I mean, yes, the whatever the chemical is that goes into the body is an important part of the process. Uh, so it's not just the drug because people can take a highly addictive drug and not get addicted. Uh, it seems to be the repetitive nature of the use and also the changes that happen in the brain and one of the underlying 
keys is loss of control. So, so people start to find disorder happening in their life, you know, and they call it a substance use disorder, you know, and there's criteria in the psychiatric manual saying meet these criteria and it's mild, meet these criteria, it's moderate. And we're not going to talk about that today. But uh, the, the reality is uh, it's loss of control. And then it's saying, I, I think I need to cut back or I need to stop and not being able to do it without getting help. So, so I, I think that's kind of the simplest definition for addiction. And, uh, you know, the really doesn't matter what the substance is, uh, it does seem to have something to do with the purity of the substance. So, mm -hmm. so we know that, um, you know, milder versions of alcohol are probably less addictive than the distilled spirits. We know that uh, the tobacco companies have been very good at enhancing the addictive nature of their uh, delivery systems. Um, and also the, the vape people, you know, they know how to make their vape vaping systems very addictive. Uh, just because you get very high levels. So, so it's not just the substance, it's how it's delivered. Uh, but essentially, the, the bottom line is the brain changes. And there's uh, reversible, treatable brain changes that happen. And, and I think that's the most important thing to really understand is addiction is treatable and that, uh, you know, needs a persistent effort and, you know, working towards uh, the process of recovery is one of the keys. And people don't have to struggle on their own. They can say, okay, let's see a professional. Let's get help. Let's try something different rather than just trying to cut back or stop on their own. Yeah. And how has the chief medical officer of Pinnacle impacted your life in helping these people? Yeah, it, it's been exciting because uh, as a physician, you know, you might impact several thousand patients over the course of a lifetime here on a daily basis i get to influence the care of over thirty-five thousand patients on a daily wow. basis you know and, and that translates into even more over the last 11 years so it, it's exciting to be working with a large number of different facilities a large number of doctors nurse practitioners nurses counselors at all different levels and and just communicating the medical side of things and also being a part of a team that that's just amazing they're, they're with the patients on a daily basis and sometimes they need somebody to kind of bounce ideas off or you know being a part of a treatment team is, is just a really novel concept you know when i was practicing uh in the office-based program, it was me and my medical assistant against the world. And, and now I have this vast team of people around me that, that are just making a huge difference. And, uh, you know, the, the other really cool thing is that we as a company are able to, you know, make it a very affordable kind of uh, process because we, you know, accept insurances and Medicaid, those kind of things. Well, it sounds like a very rewarding job because you have the community aspect, but you're also helping a lot of different people. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so what makes Pinnacle's program so special and what is the recovery success rate for you guys? Yeah. So recovery success is a very, very difficult thing to measure. So I, I can't give you a number um, that what is success to me? So, so a lot of people think, well, when I get off the medication, I'm successful. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think if somebody makes any kind of positive changes in their life, positive changes that they want to make, you know, I think that's the best measure of success. And, and it's something that actually uh, a member of the uh, uh, Chicago Recovery Alliance, uh, I believe his name was uh, John Stryker, uh, part of the part of one of the original uh, harm reductionists uh, you know this was his definition of success you know make positive changes in your life uh and self-defined changes you know that that's success so uh what what's really cool about pinnacle is we don't have like a formula like you have to do this and you this is what's going to happen to you and you have no other way to to do it, otherwise we throw you out. So, so we accept people uh, on in all different kinds of programs, all different levels of care, and 
we're able to, uh, you know, so if they want detox, we'll do that. But while they're in detox, if, especially if it's an opiate use disorder and they've relapsed a lot of times, we'll talk to them about the three different medications that might be helpful for it. And then we don't have to just say, oh, go find somewhere to go because we have places all, all over the states that we're in that provide outpatient care and, and our residential programs have affiliated sober housing and we have peer recovery specialists that are really working hard to uh, connect with the patient and say, look, I've been through this myself. Uh, what else can we do to, uh, to make things easier for you? So, so it's not just about, uh, you know, some person preaching from the highest mountain saying, you know, do this and do that. It's we meet them where they're at and uh, encourage them to make positive steps. And the other thing I'd just like to mention, so it's a new project that we have in Pinnacle in Southern Indiana. And, and what we're opening is a recovery campus that includes a psychiatric hospital, in addition to an opiate treatment program, in addition to a traditional residential program, as well as uh, outpatient counseling and that type of thing. So, so we have every single different level of care available to us. And one of the problems we're seeing is people who work strictly in psychiatric hospitals, they don't really like our patients that have addictions. You know, they, they have a hard time dealing with them. And uh, people in a lot of pure addiction programs, they may not have the psychiatric resources to help more than half of our patients who have a significant co-occurring problem going on. And so we're about to open the psychiatric hospital. We already have a residential program there. And you know, we're also looking at opening the opiate treatment program real soon. So we'll have this full continuum of care and we won't have to turn away the people that have suicidal ideation or they've been psychotic because they've been on a methamphetamine run. Uh, you know, we'll, be, we'll have a safe place where we can help them through the psychiatric emergency and, and start to get well. Uh, with appropriate medications and support. Well, I think it's great that you guys do such an individualized plan and have so many resources for them. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to be a part of this kind of organization. Yeah. And so how do you help patients prevent relapse? And what happens when a patient relapses? Yeah, so... In a lot of programs, somebody relapses and they get kicked out. You know, th this happens over and over. Or they may not get kicked out of treatment, but they lose their housing, they lose their job, you know. And so this is part of the whole harm reductionist type of thing is we don't kick people out unless there is a you know, severe risk to, uh, to the, the treatment community. So, so if we have people dealing drugs in the lobby of our outpatient program, you know, we find a different place for them to go to where they don't have all those connections. But, but we, it, it's not like something, you know, any other kinds of things that are going on, if they're yelling at us or uh, other things, we, we keep them in treatment and we try and address their psychiatric needs. Uh, make referrals if need be, get them into a higher level of care, or maybe a lower, less restrictive level of care is gonna be better for them. So, so we individualize care and, and we, we really do what we can to, uh, to educate them about their options. And uh, sometimes it's dose adjustments. So, so you might have people who are doing well, uh, abstinent from illicit drugs for a while and suddenly they have a relapse and you talk to them and it's because they're tapering off on their medicine, you know, cause they're looking at the milligrams and saying, oh, when I get to zero, I'm, I'm successful. This is gonna be great. Whereas, you know, they go from say 80 to 60 and all of a sudden they're getting uncomfortable, they're getting cravings and urges. They start doing things that aren't good for their recovery and suddenly they're relapsing. So, so maybe we need to adjust the medication or maybe it's somebody who's on uh, Suboxone, a buprenorphine program, and they're on the maximum dose and it's not helping them. You know, maybe they need the stronger medication for them. Or maybe something else is going on where they're very stressed out and they start drinking and you know, they need to go into a residential program to detox off of the alcohol and learn some new coping skills. So we have all of these different levels of care to help them when they relapse and keep them in treatment. 
Uh, but really the main way to prevent relapse is to keep him in treatment at some level of care. So people need years and years and years of counseling and support in order to recover from, from addiction problems, you know, and, and I personally did all of that hard work over many, many years, you know, and, and I'm really grateful for all the kind professionals that really encouraged me along the way and, and helped me to get to where I'm at now. And I, I'm still very active in recovery activities now too, personally. And about how many times would you say a person relapses typically? So the average person requires about eight years to get one year of continuous abstinence from illicit drugs. And usually it's about four treatment episodes. So that's the average. So, uh, so it's a long process to start to achieve some kind of stable recovery. So, so you know, it, it's not a requirement to relapse, but it, it's a very common occurrence. And, and the key is for people to stay in treatment, to learn from their relapse. And, you know, really the most, most important successful thing is to try not to die. You know, so if you stay alive through your relapse, get back into treatment, that's a success story to me. You know? But it's better if we can prevent it. But mm -hmm. that's the nature of the disease. It's really powerful, cunning, baffling. You know, it's very, very hard for people to immediately achieve, uh, you know, stable, sustained abstinence from everything. Oh, yeah, it definitely shows how powerful addiction can be. Mm -hmm. So you kind of talked about the opioid addiction um, crisis earlier, but considering the current opioid crisis, how can we recognize opioid addiction and help facilitate steps towards recovery? Sure. So people are really, really good at hiding their relapses. And people tend to be very functional until the very, very end. You know, we all have these images of, of the addict as, you know, some crazed person, you know, dope fiending all the time. And, and the vast majority of people that come into treatment, you know, they, they've been coping with it for a long time. And, and I think the key is if you think somebody might have a problem, be curious and supportive of any positive tests. So, so approach them in a very kind and supportive way and say, what can I do to help you? What's going on? You know, I'm concerned about it. express concern, express support for any positive things that they might want to do. You know, but if you come out, you know, you got a problem, you got to go away. You know, they're just, they're going to go away. You're going to have no chance to help them at that point. You know, so, so that approach, you know, and, and we know tough love is, is a death sentence for many of our patients, you know, tough love thing has killed so many people. Uh, it's insane that, that people even talk about it anymore. It, it's kindness and loving and sharing the hope of recovery that really is what helps people with addiction. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, kind of mentioned some advice there, but finally, what would you, advice would you share with our viewers about addiction and addicted treatment? Yeah, so, and I, I just want to highlight the fact that if you have a problem with a bipolar or you know you, there's some other co-occurring psychiatric problem see somebody that knows how to prescribe the right kind of medication for it because I, I see a lot of patients that have a diagnosis and they're getting the wrong kind of medication they're still being prescribed addictive medications you know and it's a whole lot easier to write a script for Xanax for somebody who's anxious uh, than to explain to them why this is a medication that's not going to be helpful. Uh, so, so it's very, very complicated, and it's very, very hard finding psychiatrists who are able and willing to take the time with, with people who have co-occurring problems psychiatrically and addiction at the same time and help them to adequately manage both. So, so that's the one thing, manage the co-occurring things. And the other thing is stay in treatment. So the whole 28-day thing was developed for alcohol. Alcohol has a very different impact on the brain to opioids. Uh, alcohol brain volumes within two or three weeks of abstinence pretty much go back to normal, whereas people who have a severe opiate problem, six months later, we can see on their brain scans, their brain's just not working right. That primitive part of the brain is still out of control, and people have a hard time making good choices. You know? so, so we need 
very, very different approach. And it's not just medication, it's ongoing counseling and it's ongoing support. And it's, it's avoiding the focus on the milligrams of whatever medication they're on. But, you know, obviously making sure that they're getting enough medicine to help them with their problem, making sure they're not over medicated with their problem. And, and just understanding that everybody's different. Some people do fine with a small number. Some people need a big number. Uh, some people, their dose needs to go up and down because of other things that are going on in their life and their metabolism changes. Well, that's great advice and insight. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and that includes our interview for today. Okay, Again, thank you. Dr. Thank J, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Take care. I'm Bree Allison for the Power of the Patient Project, the National Library of Patient Rights and Advocacy. Thanks for watching.